So, good morning. So, good morning, everybody. I would like, uh, on behalf of all organizers, to welcome you in Corfu. Uh, of course, uh, we know each other from previous meetings. Most of you, we we know very well. Uh, for those who come for the first time, uh, I should say that uh, the whole place here in Morepo is a very historical place, as you will find uh, out. The history goes back to Omirus and uh, Odyssey uh, spent several years uh, here with uh, Napsika, so they didn't want to leave the place for various reasons not only the beauty of the island. Uh, so, oh, you are welcome to discover the beauties um, yourself. Uh, the whole uh, garden here was the garden of, uh, of the palace, the, uh, the royal uh, summer uh, uh, palace. And uh, it was given uh, to the Corfu municipality in the uh, early 90s. Uh, and, uh, our institute, the history of uh, our institute started uh, in uh, 40 years ago, actually, 81, 82. And uh, in uh, 2006, we have an institute, uh, European Institute of uh, <coughs> Science and Applications, uh, which is a consortium of um, uh, the big universities and institutes uh, everything that you know from CERN to Max Planck to LNU and seven, uh, seven uh, uh, German institutes, uh, Uppsala, and uh, from Madrid to, uh, to Krakow and so on. So <clears throat> there are over 20 institutes that uh, participate. They, they are members uh, of this um, institute. Uh, Given this uh, long uh, history, of course, we started uh, losing uh, friends the last year. I mean, just to mention the last two that we lost uh, this year was uh, Weltman and uh, Steinberger. <laughs> if you look to the homepage of ASA, it looks like necrology, but uh, <clears throat> the point and our strength uh, are the new people. So. Uh, this year, uh, we'll have not only over 800 participants, but I'm very happy to tell you that um, uh, over 300, uh, they are young uh, participants, young people. So this is the strength of the whole uh, thing. Uh, the previous days, we started on uh, the 29th of uh, uh, August. Uh, we had already two workshops, which were extremely successful, I think. Uh, one was totally online uh, on uh, amplitudes, and the other was on standard model and beyond. And uh, half of the participants uh, were over 160 participants. The half of them were present. And I think also in your case, half of the participants will be uh, uh, present. Uh, another point uh, that uh, those who come uh, often uh, here and they thought that is uh, a joke after some years is that we try to renovate some buildings, some buildings here in order to have office space. And now you can see that uh, the dream is not any dream started to be realized and uh, hopefully next year we'll have office space so that you can work uh, uh, there. Uh, this is uh, the building which goes more slowly in front of us. Uh, the other two buildings, the other is uh, a bit further. They are, you know, they need one couple of months construction more. So uh, another a message that I would like to transfer to you is uh, that these buildings in principle belong to us uh, to the extent we can use them or we will use them. So this is a message uh, to all of you that we should uh, also continue to come here and organize things. Uh, otherwise, uh, naturally, they, they will be taken from us. So with uh, all this, uh, I wish you a very successful meeting. I'm sure you have the uh, potential to do excellent meeting and uh, we are here to help you from every respect. So. 
Okay, thank you, George. Uh, so, first of all, a warm welcome also uh, from the organizing committee of this event. Uh, I don't want to uh, withhold the program any further, just a few uh, comments. So, we are about 25 to 30 people right now in the auditorium. Uh, in general, whenever we are in the auditorium, uh, everybody should wear a mask. Uh, also, uh, only people who have been vaccinated should be in the auditorium, please. Everybody else uh, can attend from outside, of course, because uh, everything is uh, uh, live in YouTube. You can find the links online. Uh, exists also everything uh, on demand in YouTube. Uh, and of course, there is a Zoom link. Uh, so now, um, if somebody here wants to ask a question, please uh, raise your hand or, uh, I don't know, uh, hit the desk. Uh, and uh, just be patient uh, until some microphone comes to you so that everybody can hear you. Uh, and if somebody from online participants would like to ask a question, please raise your hands online and wait until you are given um, uh, the, the word from the uh, person who coordinates uh, the Zoom. Uh, so other than that, I welcome everybody online and in person. And uh, let us start with the, with the talks. I give word to the first chairman, who is Dieter List. Thank you, Tanase. Thank you, George. Uh, also, very warm uh, welcome from uh, my side. It's uh, really a great pleasure to see you all here for the workshop on new developments in quantum gravity and in the string theory. George was saying we know each other, that's true, and I think we even recognize each other uh, behind the mask, so I think this is also uh, fine. And uh, I think it's really good as, uh, that so many uh, of you are coming here in, in person. I think it is very um, pleasant uh, to see. I know that there will be uh, many more people watching uh, from, the, from the outside. So it's a mixed uh, hybrid uh, kind of uh, um, workshop and uh, I'm, I'm sure it will work very, very well. Um, yes, I think that's uh, basically all what I wanted to say as an uh, as an introduction. We uh, I asked the speakers to uh, to stay in uh, within the given time slot and maybe even allow for some questions uh, at the end that we keep uh, that we keep the time and with that we can start. Uh, the first speaker is uh, Ulf uh, Lindström from. Uppsala and uh, also from Ankara. Please. Okay, I assume you can hear me now. And um, it's, as always, great pleasure to be here and to talk this venue. And uh, although this year is different. It's not as different as last year when nothing happened. So uh, uh, it, it's good to see that this is coming back on the meetings. So I will be talking about uh, killing tensors and killing Yano tensors. As, and as you, as you see from the title, it's, it will be a review talk, more or less. Uh, and uh, that's to be able to introduce the, the concepts that will be, we've been using lately. Uses of killing Yano tensors should be really be uses of killing tensors and killing Yano tensors. And in as much as it's, I report on some new results, it be, it'll be results that I have derived together with Özgür Sarioglu at METU. Okay. So uh, here we go, I, I'm sure you're all familiar with the killing vector. So it, it, we're assuming that there is a background, a Riemannian or pseudo Riemannian background that we're looking at, which carries a metric and curvature and so on, connection. And uh, we call the metric G. So a killing vector then is uh, something that's preserved, that preserves the, the metric via the lead derivative. So, uh, that's the definition of a, a killing vector. And you can see from the next equation that that's equivalent to having the covariant derivative on, on the F with the lower index uh, symmetrized equals zero. 
where nabla is uh, assumed to be the levi civitas connection of of the geometry you could think of you could extend this to include also torsionful geometries but in this talk i'm not going to do that so um at least not until the very end so uh that's a killing vector a conformal killing vector naturally then preserves the metric up to a scaling of uh, a space time de dependent sp scaling so that's the next equation or in um, using again covariant derivative it's the last equation on this slide and d, d here is the, we're assuming that that the manifold has dimension capital d we will specialize at some point to three dimensions but but um, most of the talk talk it'll be uh, uh, arbitrary um, okay so um killing vectors can be generalized to killing tenses and the first equation on this this um, slide which i might be able to point at yeah this one um gives us the generalization for an, a, a rank n killing tensor so it's a completely symmetric tensor which satisfies this equation so looking at this you immediately see that uh, uh, that you already know one canonical example of a, of a rank two killing uh, tensor which is the metric which is by itself just uh, absorbed by the connection. A conformal killing tensor is then the generalization of a conformal killing vector. So it's this, which means it's got a, a right-hand side, just like the um, killing vector equation had a right-hand side, which involves the metric. So this is a lower rank tensor, rank n minus one, if this has rank one. And um, it, it, you can find its expression from this, from tracing both sides. It looks like this. Right. Now, what's the use of, of having these? Well, there are plenty of different things you can do with killing tensors and killing vectors. One of them is to um, construct, and that's something that I'll be focusing on a bit, construct invariants. Now, there are various ways of constructing invariants using killing tenses and killing Yano tenses. And this way <clears throat> refers to um, a momentum space where you have momentum P, which is defined like this. And uh, for, for a particle, say, um, well, take, should be a particle. So you can find um, the, um, so this is, the derivative along this momentum and then the geodesic equation is this and we're assuming that the geodesic equation is satisfied so um if f is an nth rank killing tensor then then this object q which is you saturate saturate the uh, f and in the indices on the killing tensor by p's that is a, a conserved quantity along the geodesics and you see that very directly by taking the the uh, derivative along the parameter tau is the parameter of the geodesic and that produces for you another p so you have nabla f with n plus one piece and then you just see that because the piece the momenta symmetrize these indices this has to vanish so that's, that's that, that's a possibility. Uh, and this can be generalized in various directions, but this is the basic way you construct uh, um, an invariant for a <clears throat> killing tensor, using a killing tensor. Now it's a little bit in, in, interesting because, because a killing vector, you, you immediately see that you have a symmetry because the uh, metric is, is uh, preserved by the killing uh, vector but uh, here it's a little bit more complicated when you have higher higher uh, rank killing vectors and but they are also useful in a different way 
And here's, I'm, I'm going between various applications here now. So this is a, another application. We saw the Q constructing a, a charge using the momenta. Here's uh, symmetries of a Laplacian. So you're looking at the Laplacian in this, this um, manifold we look, we're, we're studying. And if, if um, <coughs> there then is a linear differential operator, uh, curly D, that satisfies this relation here for some linear operator D, then that's the symmetry of the Laplacian. Now, of course, if D is itself is the, Lapla is the Laplacian, that's not so interesting. So we're assuming that D is different from the Laplacian. Now, any differential operator can be written in this form on a Riemannian manifold. And uh, this object, which should have been mu nu all the way to rho. Sorry about that, I'm switching notation. This is this, is this object and it's, a symmet it's symmetric in all its indices. So this tensor is called the symbol of the differential operator D. And the, the U and the way that the um, killing tensors come into play here is by by is via the fact that if you have a symmetry, as was shown by Eastwood in 2002, you have a symmetry uh, curly D of the Laplacian, then uh, it's equivalent to or it it, it corresponds to a um, conformal killing tensor F F union row. So this is a, a way that the, the, that the uh, conformal killing tensors come into play for symmetry of a theory. So of course, this uh, could be, um, this could be the, the, the uh, uh, Laplacian could, is the field equation for some interesting uh, physical system we're assuming. Now that, that those two applications pertain to uh, killing tensors. There are also killing Yano tensors, which I now have to define for you. So a killing Yano tensor is defined in this way. So it's, a, it's an N form. Remember, a killing tensor is a, completely symmetric. This is completely anti-symmetric. And it satisfies this equation. And you can show that that equation is equivalent to this one. So that the covariant derivative on K just gives you something completely anti-symmetrized. And then of course, just like we had, we could generalize a, a killing tensor to conformal killing tensors. We can generalize a killing Yano tensor to uh, conformal killing Yano tensors, which is, means we keep this piece here but we get an, uh, an extra bit related to the trace of, of K. So, uh, and, and a particular role, which I'm not gonna be able to go into here is played by those uh, conformal Kiliano tenses that are closed. Uh, C, C, K, Y, T, as they, the acronym, acronym goes. And these are important uh, for finding all the symmetries of, of, of um, black holes, for example. Okay, um, so that was some examples of uh, killing uh, tenses and Kiliano tenses and what you can do with them. And here is a partial list of interesting applications of, of killing tenses and Kiliano tenses. First, um, we talked about invariance for particles using a killing tensor. Now, generalizing killing tensors to killing Yano tensors, you can actually find invariance of spinning particles. So supersymmetric uh, with world line supersymmetry, as was uh, first discussed, I believe, by, by these people, Ibans and et al. in 1993 in the, in the um, famous paper, Super Susie in the Sky, which you should look at. It can, just like a, a killing tensor, 
was um, something that gave us the, the uh, possible symmetries of, of the Laplacian. You can generalize that or, or specialize whichever way you want to think about it to, to fermionic equations, like the Dirac equations, equation, and then it's Killingiano tenses that, and their generalizations that come into play. This, we, we looked at this in um, uh, the super space set setting uh, some time ago, and where it, it's not just Laplace and Dirac, but different supersymmetric Laplaceans that, that we study. There's also one important application of uh, killing tenses, which is separation of variables. We'll, I'll show you a very brief example of that. And the relation between killing tenses and killing Yano tenses is that a killing Yano tensor, if you take it square, you get a killing tensor. Yet another application then is um, to conserve charges and as asymptotic conserved charges. So if you, you, you use the killing uh, Yano tensors to construct, as we'll see, conserved currents, and uh, using those conserved currents, you can you find uh, conserved charges in some cases. And in particular, you can follow the, the um, lead of uh, Abbott and Desser who discussed how to construct asymptotic charges for the, when they discussed uh, gauge theories, asymptotic gauge theories in gravitational background and stability of um, um, theories with um, a cosmological constant. And that method applied to these uh, conserved currents leads to conserved, uh, asymptotically conserved charges in some cases as described by th these people. In, in discussing these things, and here I, I touch on the stuff that we've been doing, uh, you want to investigate the uh, currents in detail. And in doing that, uh, you, can fi you find new identities for the um, killing Yano tensors. Super, they, they, you can supersymmetrize these objects as, as um, write them as supersymmetric objects, as we did in these papers, both killing and killing Yano tenses. And that uh, is something I'll return to at the very end if I have time. Now, applications in string theory has a, as, as a theory or a history since 97. An important paper was uh, written by Lunen and uh, Shavoni in 2015. And of course, we've been talking about symmetries and conserved currents for particles. But if you think of, you remember that the, the, uh, the uh, uh, limit of strings give you particles. So if you have a, a solution that you think of is a solution to string theory, uh, you, look, you can look at its particle um, limit and you can discuss these kinds of conserved currents or conserved charges, I should say, in that case. Okay, so let me just quickly run you through the conservation of, uh, sorry, the separation of variables. So um, the Hamilton-Jacobi equation, you should all recognize where S is, is Hamilton's principal function. And this could be, for example, coming from a, a discussion of um, 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 the geodesic equation for some interesting, um, black hole background. And then you want to separate the variables. So the, the variables, I call them X and Y, and you want to separate them into one, one part of S that only depends on S, X and one that only depends on Y. The ansatz for doing that is to assume that this metric has this form, one function of only X and one function of only Y and then divided by a function, which is the difference of two functions, f of x and f of y. If you do that, then um, the hamilton jacobi separates. So you find this familiar things from, uh, I don't know, uh, one of the basic mechanics courses in physics, that this part 
is depends only on x and this part depends only on on uh, y so that means that that this by itself is an integral of the motion and uh, we write it like this and here i use the um, um, equation for mu so this should be a minus sign sorry about that should be a minus sign here and but the punchline is that once you you've uh, been able to separate you know that this has to be it has to be possible to write this using a second rank killing tensor in this form so this this piece and and you can actually construct that killing tensor out of of the ingredients i've shown you um but the, the difficult part is the inverse of course given a kill a second rank killing tensor how do you separate variables that's discussed in for for example the paper by lunin so now i turn to the um, the um, proposition that the square of a killing yano tensor is always a killing tensor so here i've contracted a nth rank killing yano tensors on all but one index for each and if you then take the covariant derivative of this object it splits into these two um, <clears throat> differentiate, differentiating you find this and then um, a short calculation shows you that if you symmetrized on sigma mu and nu on this guy you get zero so that means that f mu nu by def this is the definition of a second rank uh, killing tensor the same story is also true for conformal killing tensors but not for higher rank so if you if this was a conformal rank two conformal then you would get a new conformal the rank two but not in general this is this is um actually uh important because uh, uh you you all because a very useful way of of, of using uh killing yano tensors is, is is to use them to to define a killing a second rank killing tensor so it's often easier to find the killing yano tensors you find them and then you, you you find the killing tensor by this construction this is is, is uh, a very useful um, another use of the killing yano tensors okay so now we come to conserved currents so uh, i start by by uh, reminding you of a uh, of the mathematics behind it if you have a, co a covariantly conserved uh, object like this nth rank uh, for n form then uh, then that by Poincaré lemma or actually an extension to uh, co-derivatives you you find that this has to be true that you have to be able to write the current as the uh, divergence of, 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 of n plus one form and once you have that you can use that to construct conserved charges using this l and there's a very interesting in example with, which is the castor thrashen current which is this this object that contains an nth rank killing yano tensor and the various curvatures uh, well con contraction this is the curvature tensor this is the rigid tensor and this is the curv curvature scalar this is covariantly constant and that's that's something that's quite remarkable and you have to use of course the uh, bianchi identities for the r here and um, a, you can then use that to construct um, conserved currents even asymptotically conserved currents so by asymptotically conserved current i mean that i take my metric i split it into a background metric and a, an, and a, a perturbation and i i look at it to this order in h and then you can uh, study the um, uh, current i just gave you the custer thrashing current and in the linearized case so here l r are the linearized curvatures 
and k bar is the background um, uh, is a background Killingiano tensor. Okay, and under for certain geometries, the the Bianchi identities uh, for the linearized curve, uh, curvature and so on uh, are satisfied, still satisfied. And you can use uh, this to construct a, a conserved charge Q mu and asymptotic charge. Um, this, is, this means that you can start from a geometry which doesn't have a Killingiano tensor, but asymptotically it has a Killingiano tensor. And that's enough to construct these uh, charges. One, okay, one important. Um, Uh, comments there is that that the um, uh, it's not clear what these charges mean. The, the physical interpretation hasn't been elucidated. Okay, so uh, let me step up the speed a little bit. Here we have uh, an identity. Oh, sorry, not that fast. So we have an identity which is uh, generalizes the killing vector identity. Um, down here, and that was we, we need to use that to uh, prove the existence of this L we used in the previous slide to construct a, a, a conserved asymptotically conserved charge, and um, we can also we we can generalize um, this. Having generalized this, we can use it to to show that more identities. This is one identity for a rank two um, killing tensor. And the, the generalized, the general relation looks like this. Just note that it contains curve, uh, geometry and killing Yano tensors. And we can de then derive this type of uh, uh, relation and prove that this object is then covariantly conserved. And that would be a nice way of trying to understand the the um, uh, physics behind uh, conserved currents, because there's, this is the uh, re, um, Einstein tensor. So it's related to the um, 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 energy momentum tensor, of course. And, and one might hope to find uh, relations which elucidate the physical uh, implication of, of a potential conserved charge. Okay, uh, let's go to the cotton tensor now. This is the definition of the cotton tensor, uh, where S is the Schalten tensor, and the, the, these are the properties it has. And we can, and then we combine that with a second rank Killingiano, conformal Killingiano tensor, and we find that in fact, that current is conserved. And uh, we can define a charge from that for that current, which is done here, um, like that. And this should be d to the power of d minus one. And uh, the issue uh, here is to show that, that we actually have convergence so that this gives us a meaningful, uh, we can get give this a meaningful interpretation. We've checked that on for this particular plebansky demyansky uh, metric, but it's not conclusive yet. So now down to three dimensions, two minutes for three dimensions. Well, that's less than one. Well, uh, so we can start then from the cotton York tensor, which is, which is this guy. And uh, we can uh, show that that is in fact conserved. Uh, that that we can construct a conserved current from that. Sorry. Okay. And 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 th this is um, uh, we can construct a, co a current for this, and the, this current is related to a current that been discussed by Desser and Tekin. Let me just. I wanted to finish by going to conformal supergravity. Uh, so I, sorry, I had to run through that a little bit too fast. 
Here's the definition of three-dimensional conformal supergravity in superspace using the commutators and anti-commutators of the covariant derivative. And here you can introduce a super cotton tensor, W. And uh, a, well, W is actually the cotino. So nabla on W is the super cotton tensor. And the, the point here is that you can use this if you introduce something that is a, a conformal chilling uh, vector, super vector. So uh, it obeys this, it, it, it's defined in this, this way. Then it follows that it satisfies a number of different relations. This is one and this is another. And if you interpret this at the at theta zero level, you find the um, conformal killing vector here and the, the uh, conformal killing spinner here. Right. And these objects you can use to again construct a um, cotton current, a super cotton current. So that's what I've done here. This is a spinner and this is a vector. Pairs of spinner indices give us vectors in three dimensions. And, and they're defined in these ways and satisfy nabla, the spinorial uh, divergence on this is zero and the ordinary divergence of, of the vector is zero. And the lowest component of the first part of K a, a alpha beta, the first part of that in the, in, in the uh, bosonic limit is the bosonic cotton current. And we can write that as a multiplet a little bit more uh, covariantly in this way. And then with A denoting alpha and or, and or alpha beta, it satisfies this. So zero minutes, I have to stop here, uh, but let me just make the comment that the, what you saw here last is, is a new way of uh, using uh, Killingiano and uh, conformal Killingiano and conformal killing tensors in supergravity. You'd expect that you could generalize the uh, currents and um, charges, concerned charges from the bosonic case to super, supergravity. And this proves that yes, you can in three dimensions and it opens up the uh, possibility of studying such relations for arbitrary supergravity. In particular, uh, we recently uh, constructed uh, symmetries in six dimensions, six dimensional conformal supergravity in superspace. And uh, that's where I think that this kind of application should fall. Okay, I've, my time is up, so thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Ulf, for this nice talk. Thank you. Still, we have time for questions. Maybe I have a very quick one. You were, were discussing tensors. Can you discuss also killing spinners or generalizations of uh, uh, higher rank uh, spinners? Yes. Uh, in in uh, the work with Paul, on super killing Yano tensors and super killing tensors. They, they, uh, they are generalized so that the components are, uh, will be killing spinners and so on. And it's even more than that. You can you remember that I, I used the expansion of a, a killing uh, vector in terms of momenta. You can expand a, a general in terms of bosonic and fermionic momenta and find these kind of results, but that takes us too far. Right? Yes. Yeah. Other questions? That's apparently is not the case. So we thank you again. Thank you.
pues. Trying to get permission on Zoom to share my screen. So we're now. Yeah. Yeah. So let me announce the speaker and the talks. The next speaker is Eric Lochin from Utrecht University. He talks uh, about the tadpole conjecture at large. Very much. Um, thank you very much for the introduction and uh, for the invitation to um, be uh, able to speak here. Uh, it's always great to come back to Corfu, especially since we we weren't uh, able to be here last year. So what I want to talk is, uh, about is the tadpole conjecture at large complex structure. Uh, let me first briefly mention that this talk is based on a paper which appeared uh, about one and a half weeks ago. Um, I might be saying something about an upcoming paper, but let's see, this depends a bit on the time um, I will have. So let me just start with some uh, motivation. Um, a very broad set of motivations is that uh, we know that compactifications of string theory give rise to an abundance of uh, low dimensional uh, theories. And that's typically called the string theory landscape. And even though these numbers are not necessarily representatives, but there are some famous estimates of uh, these numbers. And just to illustrate what kind of sizes we are, are talking about, so initial estimates from 10 to, or 10 to the 500, 10 to 930, 10 to 1,500, and even uh, bigger than that. Um, however, despite this, this enormous size of this landscape, um, many times we are, we're not interested in all of these background. Right? So in particular, um, uh, in, in some people, in, in some cases, we're only interested in uh, four-dimensional vacuum with no or very few master scalar fields. And many of these, which you count here, might have um, an abundance of, of, of master scalar fields, which we are just simply not interested in. And in order to get, get rid of these master scalar fields, the moduli, um, for instance, in type 2 b oriented fold compactification, the Calabia threefolds, uh, we can turn on fluxes, which generate potential for these fields, and make them massive, right? So we, we start from a Calabi Yao, we add some additional ingredients, to, we, which are the fluxes. This will create some back reaction, which will deform the geometry such that initially massless uh, fields will now become massive. And um, in particular for the complex structure moduli and for the oxidilaton, this is one of the underlying assumptions of the KKLT and large volume scenarios. Right? so one of the steps you do there is that, okay, I'll, I have such a big flux choice, you know, I'll, I'll just pick some flux. There will exist some flux, which will stabilize these moduli in a suitable regime. So I don't really need to care too much about this. In principle, this works, and we don't need to spend too much time thinking about this. However, this assumption, which is often made, can fail. And um, for instance, uh, in, in this paper from 2018, uh, the authors show that if you want to stabilize moduli at the conifold uh, locus and to have a sufficient control, you have to have fluxes which exceed a tadpole charge by, uh, uh, which have a tadpole charge, which exceeds the bounds from the tadpole cancellation condition by much, right? So there, this is very tricky to do that. Uh, in a paper with uh, a student we, uh, we showed two years ago, if you want to stabilize moduli in a perturbative controlled regime, that can be very, very difficult, again, with the tadpole band. And uh, there's also a paper by Brown and Valando who look in uh, M-theory compactifications and show that, in, indeed, it's not always possible to stabilize all of these moduli. So this assumption, which is often made uh, in these scenarios, can fail. So this means we should look maybe uh, a little bit closer at them. And uh, a bit more drastically, um, 
continue along this line, um, uh, the tadpole conjecture had been made. And this tadpole conjecture states that if there are a large number of complex structure moduli, it turns out or the conjecture says not all of them can be stabilized by fluxes. And this is this uh, famous conjecture from um, basically last year. So my goal for this talk is, well, explain a bit more what the tetra conjecture is about, make it a bit more precise, but also explain why it is difficult to prove this conjecture and then show that, uh, at least in the large complex structure limit, the conjecture is generically satisfied. Um, I carefully chosen words here, and I'll, I'll try to illustrate that uh, later on. So this brings me to uh, the outline. So motivation I've just done. So let me just start with a brief recap of uh, the Tapo conjecture. I'm going to be brief, and I think um, there'll be other speakers at this conference who are going to explain it in more detail. Uh, so I'll just um, review some, some essentials. So what I want to do is I want to explain the Tadpole conjecture. So um, if we talk about string theory compactifications on orientifolds, typically orientifold planes have to be present and D brains, and these are charged under the Ramon Ramon gauge potentials, and therefore they contribute to their Bianchi identities. The integrated version of the Bianchi identities are called the uh, Tadpole cancellation conditions. Now, there are several of them. I mean, I'm focusing on type 2b uh, oriented fold compactifications. There are several of them, D3, D5, and D7 brain tadpoles. Uh, but in particular, the D3 brain tadpole, if I formulate it in F, or if I lift it to F theory, um, can be formulated in uh, this way, where ND3 is the number of D3 brains I'm introducing, and flux is a number which encodes uh, the contribution of fluxes, uh, G4 from flux in F theory, and H3 and F3 flux in type 2 and uh, chi is the Euler number of the fourfold I'm um, compactifying uh, F theory. Now, if you now, well, let's just do that. Uh, um, if we want to take the limit of large H31, so we're looking at compactification spaces, so Calabria fourfolds, which have large H31, it turns out that this Euler number uh, can be expanded in a certain way, and it turns out that uh, this becomes uh, this quantity over here, so H31 divided by four approximately. And um, since the number of these three points should be positive, I'm going to get this bound uh, in this limit. Now, the Tepo conjecture basically says that uh, in this limit, the flux number uh, should be bigger than this, which is incompatible, obviously, with this. So this means um, this Tepo cancellation condition in the large H31 limits if the conjecture is true, cannot be satisfied. This means in the large H31 limit, I cannot stabilize all the complex structure moduli. So that's the essence of uh, the conjecture. So let me just state it once more. So if true, the type of conjecture means that we cannot stabilize, or that we cannot stabilize all the moduli, and this means the landscape of theories with no or very few mass of scalar fields is, is much smaller than expected. And how much smaller? Well, this is something to, to explore and to understand. Uh, let me briefly comment that uh, this, what I just discussed was an F theory, but I can uh, also reduce it down to type 2b oriented fold compactifications. This is what I will be focusing uh, in this talk. Um, I'm sure, uh, I think Severin is going to talk about this. I'm sure he's going to explain this more. Um, it turns out this factor, which was on the previous slide one third, turns out to be in one, many examples 0 0.44. And it's not really clear why this is the case. But uh, this was observed uh, also in these papers. And let me also mention that uh, a counter scenario to uh, this conjecture has been proposed by Machisano Pietro Niso in this paper, uh, which says that we can evade this conjecture. Um, I'm not going to say much uh, about this, and I think maybe Severin is going to say a bit about this. So he's Severin Lewis is one of the authors of the conjecture, and he's going to speak, I think, on Thursday, so I'll uh, reserve some of the uh, discussion to him on Wednesday or Thursday. He's going to speak at some point later this week. All right, so this is the, the this is the tuple conjecture. Um, what I want to want to do is I want to uh, discuss this flux number uh, which I had before, and I want to estimate its behavior when approaching a boundary. This is to to gain some intuition for uh, the second part to discuss uh, to um, discuss it at, at large complex structure. All right. So let me now be a bit more precise and uh, give some more formulas. So what we want to consider is type to be oriented fold compactifications in Columbia threefolds, and we're going to turn on an SNS and Ramon Ramon three-form fluxes, um, just the standard thing which you do in 
uh, and, and flux convectifications. Um, the global minimum with the scalar potential, this is uh, vanishing F terms, uh, corresponds to the self duality condition uh, of the G3 flux, which is this particular combination, tau is the exodilaton. <laughs> and what I can do is I can rewrite this condition. I just separate it in real and imaginary parts and then write it in uh, matrix notation. And in matrix notation, the Hodge star operator. Uh, can be represented by matrix M, which is this curly M here. And this curly M depends on the convex structure moduli. And this S is the part of the dilaton, and so is the C part of the dilaton, is the axion. <clears throat> so I have to solve basically this condition. F3 and H3 are just flux quanta. And in order to stabilize moduli, I just have to solve uh, this condition. And I'm just saying just, um, that's rather complicated and it's not easy to do. And in this notation, the flux number uh, is defined like this. this is just the, uh, the match product between F3 and H3. And in this convention, it's positive. Okay, so this is the setting uh, we'll be working in. Now, um, this Hodge star matrix, um, if you look at this, it turns out it, it's real. Uh, it's symmetric, and it's also symplectic, which means that you can decompose it in this way, where the sigma is um, uh, is uh, is this matrix here, uh, where lambda is basically a diagonal matrix, which half of the eigenvalues, and then the lambda inverse is the other one. So the determinant, for instance, of every symplectic matrix is one, uh, which makes sense. And um, this uh, matrix U here is a matrix which is both symplectic and uh, orthogonal. And it's called a block messier decomposition. Now, this condition I had before, the self duality condition, can now be uh, rephrased like this. and the nice thing is now that these are these blocks here are now diagonal matrices, and uh, so these tilde vectors are just defined like this. And I can also now go ahead and use uh, this condition to compute this flux number, and that's basically the the dilaton uh, times this combination, where these are the eigen eigenvalues again of this matrix, and these are the flux quanta uh, of H three, for instance. Now, let's study that um, expression. <clears throat> and in particular, we want to study it when approaching a boundary in moduli space. So a boundary in complex structure moduli space means um, typically the, the metric or the Hodge star uh, degenerates. Right? So in this decomposition earlier, this matrix U is orthogonal and symplectic. This can't degenerate. So the only thing that can degenerate is the eigenvalue. And you have a eigenvalue lambda and one over lambda, so without loss of generality, I'm just saying uh, lambda to infinity is one degeneration. And if you look at it, uh, for instance, here, if lambda goes to infinity and the, all the rest stays finite, uh, this flux number diverges. When I'm approaching a boundary parameterized by a diverging eigenvalue, my flux number will generically diverge. And the same is true for the dilaton. It just multiplies this thing. So these are positive terms, right? So I forgot to say that these are positive terms. So uh, if the dilaton uh, approaches uh, its boundary as to uh, infinity, then also this flux number diverges. Okay. So that's a statement. Once I approach a boundary in moduli space, and if I manage to stabilize the moduli correctly, this flux, this uh, flux number here uh, will diverge. Now. I was very sketchy, very rough. I should say this uh, generically here is important. Uh, and this is not a proof what I showed. Uh, one has to now carefully distinguish um, some, some subtle limits which could uh, avert that. And uh, that's more difficult. And I haven't proven that statement. That's why there's a generic leader. Um, what does this imply? What does it tell us? Well, it tells us that if I want to have the smallest value for this flux number, right? This will not be found deep inside of complex structure moduli space. I should be as far away from any boundaries as possible. So if I want to prove the tapo conjecture or find uh, kind of a lowest minimal value, I should be very far away from boundaries. And in that limit, I deep in the interior of moduli space, I typically have very little control over the moduli space geometry. Right? All what we know is we typically do around uh, boundary expansion at large complex structure or at the conifold or at other points. Um, it is always around the boundary, but this means I have to go to win. So this why this, this shows kind of why it's difficult and how it can be difficult to uh, prove this tadpole conjecture. 
Now, let me just comment that this behavior that the flux on uh, diverges, this can be made more precise using asymptotic Koch theory, and uh, this is in a paper by Thomas Grimm uh, from, from last year. Uh, but explaining asymptotic Koch theory in a 20 minute, half an hour talk is maybe a bit, uh, a bit much. So, um, what I want to do now, using that information, I want to show uh, I want to show how the tuple conjecture works in the uh, large complex structure. So now a little bit more formulas. So in the large complex structure regime, uh, the modular space can be described by a prepotential. Prepotential is given here. These are the triple intersection numbers of the mirror dual uh, threefold, <clears throat> and these projective coordinates x. Um, they combine into the complex structure moduli, and well, the moduli are running over the dimensionality of the modular space. Um, now, playing the same trick as before, this flux numbers, I can just use the equations of motion to uh, rewrite this flux number, and it turns out it can rewrite it in this particular way, where um, this kappa here is this combination, this has to be positive, and G is the Kähler metric, which has to be positive definite. So this flux number here is a sum of uh, semi positive definite terms. So these terms can't cancel against each other, they just add up. Now, <clears throat> what, um, what you can do is to <clears throat> estimate kind of how, how, does, how do these numbers kind of uh, scale. And these triple intersection numbers, um, well, the indices run from one to H to one, the dimension of modular space. And the way um, the number of non-zero entries of this uh, number, they, um, they have been um, statistically determined in this paper by uh, Demirtas, Long, McAllister, and Stillman. <clears throat> and using that data, we can basically estimate the scaling of this flux number. So in case H0 and F0, so the leading terms here are zero, then the scaling only comes from here, and it scales like this, where V is the Euclidean norm of the uh, Saxion vector defined over here. But it turns out actually, so I, I studied many examples, um, also just randomly generate them. And it turns out if you want to stabilize all the moduli, H0 and F0 can't be simultaneously zero. So this case is kind of, I think it's excluded, I just can't prove it. Uh, but, and otherwise, um, if H0 and F0 are, are non-zero, then the flux number scales generically this way. Uh, the second bit of information uh, now uh, is the following. So we know that a large complex structure, the complex structure modular space is mirror dual to the Kähler modular space. So we are basically here in complex structure modular space, but on the mirror symmetry in this limit, um, this is dual to a Kähler modular space, and the Kähler modular space um, is bounded by a Kähler cone. Right? That is what I'm saying here. And by the same argument, by mirror symmetry, also the complex structure modular space is bounded by a cone, and I think I called it complex structure cone. I didn't think that's a, uh, well, I just called it like this. And the main thing, the main input is now this paper here where they um, look at the kreutz scarpe list and go through it and determine statistical data on various properties uh, of this cone, which then biomarial symmetry uh, relates the data on this cone. So I'm gonna briefly review this. Um, oh no, one, one more thing I should define. <clears throat> So I just said um, the Kähler cone on the now on the mirror dual side, that's just a cone which contains all Kähler forms such as curves, divisors, and Calabria volume itself are positive. And so this is the so this is the interior of the cone and the boundary of the cone, some two cycle goes to zero, some four cycle goes to zero, or even the Calabria itself, uh, the volume goes to zero. So this is one of these cones. However, um, these people here they define a strict Kähler cone. So it's basically the uh, uh, darker shaded region in between. And the idea is to say that all of these volumes don't just have to be positive, that, but they have to be positive than some number C. So this means you, you're going away a distance of C from the boundary of this cone. And how big C is, well, I'm gonna to come to this later. And the important thing which is gonna come on the next slide is now that um, if you have a white Kähler cone like this, you can, well, in both cases, you can determine the, the distance from the origin of the Kähler cone to the origin of the stretched Kähler cone. And if the Kähler cone is wide, this, like, it's wide open, the angle between the, the boundaries is, uh, is large, then this minimal distance is rather small. 
However, if you have a very narrow Kähler cone, so the cone becomes very narrow, well, as you see already here, this, this minimal distance becomes larger, right? So the more narrow the cone, the larger this uh, distance. And now coming back to this paper and the statistical data, what they did was for the Kreutzer Skarkalis, they determined many things, but among them, um, uh, how narrow the cone becomes. And it turns out if you increase the dimension of modular space, this cone becomes more and more and more narrow. And that is in a logarithmic plot shown here. And they uh, estimate it like this. Okay. So indeed, this minimal distance grows with the uh, two and a half power of the dimensionality of the modular space. What I'm going to actually need is an estimate on the lower bound. Uh, I'm just again, going to take this part. Okay, I think now I have everything together. Uh, to put uh, these two ingredients together. So on the one hand side, I uh, made an estimate on how this flux number scales, uh, one with the dimensionality, now we are back on complex structure side, uh, with the dimension, gamma is one and three, depending on whether H0 and F0 or zero or not. And then we have this estimate um, on this minimal distance. I can just combine them uh, into this formula here. So the flux, this is now how the flux number generically depends on the dimensionality of the moduli space and on this constant C. So this, this constant C is um, parameterizes minimal volumes uh, on the mirror dual side, right? So if I'm approaching the, the, the boundary of the cone, some volume shrinks to zero. So in some sense, uh, C um, determines this, um, this volume. And in particular, if I want to have some well-defined large complex structure expansion, this C should not be much smaller than one. You can check this in examples. You, you, uh, there are various arguments, but it, C shouldn't be much smaller than one. Also, coming back to the argument I had before, if C gets smaller, you're approaching the, the, the boundary of the Kähler cone. And again, this flux number should uh, increase, which I can't describe because, because I'm in a, in a different expansion. Now, let's have a look at this and just plot this. So what I plotted here is this number n flux uh, for different values of c. It's difficult to read, I think. This is c equals 1, c equals 0 0.1, 0 0.03, 0 0.01. I said these uh, numbers are, they should be larger than 1. So already this number here is kind of the boundary. And these numbers, I shouldn't really consider them. But just for illustration, I included them. And uh, this is, OK, this is the flux number, the formula I just showed. And this here is this linear behavior of the tadpole conjecture, uh, which was stated earlier. And it's, if you just plot that, you see that, so if you take c equals 1 and say gamma equals 1, you see that the behavior of the flux number already for dimensions h to 1 around 15 or so um, exceed already the, the tadpole conjecture. And even if you say for some reason you would be able to allow uh, values like this, which are smaller than the latest at 100, say, is the, the estimated uh, growth of the flux exceeds the bound of the tadpole conjecture by far. And I showed this here for gamma equals 1, gamma equals 3. In principle, I said, I don't have a proof, but gamma equals 1, if you want to stabilize all the moduli, should be excluded. So one actually should focus on this. And again, here, um, this is bigger growth than the tadpole conjecture. conjecture. So in that sense, um, what, on, what I showed here, that for generic flux choices and in the large complex structure limit, this type of conjecture will be satisfied. Now, there's a caveat if this smaller flux numbers, which maybe violate this type of conjecture, maybe found outside of the large complex structure regime, or if I make very non generic flux choices, um, which might lead to a, a different scaling. So, what I and it here is not a proof of the type of conjecture in this limit but it just shows a generic behavior. So generically, I would expect uh, this to be true. So since I'm running out of time, let me briefly summarize. Um,
Thank you very much, Eric, for this very nice and interesting talk. Other questions? Wait for the microphone, please. Hi. Oh. Hi. Thank Hi. You. Very nice talk. So I was wondering if um, so. Would you say that this scenario proposed by highly non If so, can you can you actually be in their choices of, of fluxes and uh, things? So we we are so we are looking at the scenario, but we. We're not done yet looking at it, let's say it like this. Um, the safe answer is they would have a very uh, non generic flux choice. Um, but I think Severin is going gonna, is gonna to say much more about this, so I don't want to take too much away from, from that. Um, so, from, from this point of view, uh, would, this might be something non generic indeed. Uh, but yeah, let's. I, I would refer to the talk by Severin, that would make. Uh, he okay, probably you. is going to say more about this. More questions? I think also the, the Zoom audience is invited to ask questions in principle. Right, also thanks for the nice talk. Um, is it true that you have definitely proven that the landscape is smaller, even if you have not proven the tadpole conjecture? Yes, in some sense I've proven that the landscape is, is smaller than, than expected, but the question is by how much? Um, even if it's by much, then how much of an effect has it? That's the question.
And so uh, the next speaker is Emmanuel Malik from the Humboldt University in Berlin. And he talks about Kaluza Klein spectroscopy for string compactifications. Thank you very much. Um, so today I want to tell you about a powerful new tool that I've developed with uh, various collaborators, which allows us to compute the Kaluza Klein spectra of a large class of string compactifications, including compactifications which have few or no remaining symmetries or even supersymmetries. This is based on work done in collaboration uh, with Henning Samtleben in particular, as well as a number of other collaborators, uh, including, uh, for example, Adolfo Guarino, who is also here. Okay, let me briefly motivate why we're interested in computing the Kaluza Klein spectra. Whenever we compactify higher dimensional theory to lower dimensions, like we do all the time in string theory, we get a tower of massive modes. And the masses of these modes are the lower dimensional signature that we started off from a higher dimensional theory. In particular, the masses tell us the precise shape of the geometry that we started off with, and we can therefore reconstruct the higher dimensional theory if we can compute this Kaluza Klein spectrum. More practically, um, there's two applications that I will discuss today. The first is to the ADS-CFT correspondence. There, the masses of these Kaluza Klein fields um, tells us about the conformal dimensions of operators in the CFT, which is very hard to compute directly. And then secondly, I will also discuss the stability of non-supersymmetric vacua. Here, the Kaluza Klein spectrum tells us about the perturbative stability of these vacua. And one key message that you will see from the applications that I will consider is that you should be very careful with overly trusting lower dimensional supergravity theories in particular in the context of ADS-CFT, there are certain features that you will miss just by looking at the lower dimensional theory and which only become apparent when you know the uplift to 10 or 11 dimensional supergravity or indeed strength theory, um, or alternatively by computing this Kaluza Klein spectrum. Now, the typical example that you would know of a Kaluza Klein spectrum comes from looking at the free scale of fields in D plus one dimensions and compactifying on a circle. In this case, the story is very simple. So we have the free scalar field. This is its equation of motion. It depends on D coordinates X and then the coordinate Y on the circle. Because it's a field on the circle, we can perform a, a Fourier series. And in particular, the Fourier modes are eigenmodes of the Laplacian um, on the circle, dy squared. And therefore we find that we get a tower of massive states whose masses are given by an integer k over r. Uh, this integer k is just the label for the Fourier modes. However, what happens if we try and do a similar story in supergravity? So for example, consider 11 dimensional supergravity. The equations of motions are very complicated. Even if we linearize for fluctuations around some background, there's still a horrible mess. So here I've written down one of the equations of motions that you get in 11 dimensional supergravity. The precise form isn't important. I just want to emphasize how horrible it is. It depends on the background four form field strength, capital F. Of course, on the fluctuation of the four form field strength, little f, on the fluctuations of the metric, and then of course also on the, in general, complicated background metric that raises and lowers all the indices. So even just looking at this equation, it's very hard to know what we should, we should do to try and find eigenmodes of this operator. And in fact, until my recent work, only two cases were understood. These were on the one hand, the case where we have, um, where we only look at spin two fields. So then we could compute the full spectrum of spin two fields around arbitrary backgrounds, but none of the masses of any other fields. Alternatively, we could look at very simple backgrounds. So looking at a compactification that forms a symmetric space, then we can use group theory and compute the full spectrum. But this used to be the only two cases that were understood. 
Now, there's in fact another tool that's useful in computing Kaluza client spectra, and it will play an important role in my talk. So I want to talk about it in a little bit more detail. And this is known as consistent truncations. In a consistent truncation, we want to keep only a subset of the Kaluza client modes, or we want to keep them to arbitrary nonlinear order. And in particular, the consistency is that the lower dimensional theory that we then get should have a variety of solutions, and these solutions should be solutions of the higher dimensional theory as well. So for example, uh, if we look at type 2b supergravity around ADS5 times S5, we can perform a truncation on the modes of the five sphere, in particular, choosing only the lowest lying modes um, of the Kaluza Klein spectrum. This gives us a five dimensional supergravity theory with some interesting potential and various vacua. And the consistency requirement is that all of these vacua correspond to true solutions of type to be supergravity in 10 dimensions. The reason why this consistent truncation is useful for the Kaluza Klein spectrum is because we can then use the consistent truncation to compute the masses of any of these modes that we kept in the truncation as we deform the background as we go to some other vacuum of the consistent truncation. So for example, we would have the round sphere when all of the scalar fields are turned off, we can uh, compute all of the masses. But now, if we deform the five sphere within the consistent truncation by going to some other complicated vacuum, we can use the consistent truncation to at least compute um, the mass is corresponding to the subset of the moles that we've kept in the truncation. However, this doesn't yet tell you what happens to all of the other fields. Now with Henning Samtleben, I developed a method based around exceptional field theory, which allows us to compute the full spectrum of Kaluza-Klein modes around any of these vacua within the consistent truncation. So here's a brief outline of the talk. I will first um, quickly tell you about exceptional field theory and how it describes consistent truncations, since this plays an important role. I will then show you how we can extend this to compute the full Kaluza client spectrum around any of these vacua. And then finally, I will discuss a couple of applications. Remember, I told you what makes computing the Kaluza client spectrum in supergravity so difficult is that the equations of motions, even at the linearized level, involve a complicated mixing of the metric and fluxes. Now, exceptional field theory is a reformulation of 10 or 11 dimensional supergravity, which unifies the metric and fluxes into some new notion of geometry. And this is therefore well suited to try and study the problem. So in particular, let's consider 11 dimensional supergravity compactified on some seven dimensional manifold C7. Then if we look at the bosonic fields, the metric, the three form and the six form, these actually can be combined into some larger object known as a generalized metric, which now parameterizes some coset space, uh, E77, the seventh rank um, exceptional group over its maximal compact subgroup, SU8. And this appearance of the exceptional groups is why uh, this is known as exceptional field theory. Moreover, we can look at the local symmetries of the 11 dimensional supergravity. We have diffeomorphism symmetries generated by vector fields. We have gauge transformations for the three forms and six forms. All of these parameters we can combine into some larger object known as a generalized vector field, which now transforms in the 56 dimensional representation of this exceptional group E7. And then finally, we can act with these generalized vector fields on our generalized objects like the generalized metric and recover exactly the symmetries of all of these objects. And this works by a generalization of the lead derivative known as the generalized lead derivative. Okay. We can do more than just reorganize all the bosonic fields. We can also rewrite the action. So in particular, the 11 dimensional supergravity action can be rewritten as an action quadratic in derivatives of this generalized metric. And here, these derivatives that I've written, these are some 56 dimensional derivatives, uh, but it's just a fancy way of writing the ordinary seven dimensional derivatives on the internal space, just embedded into some 56 dimensional representation just so I can write something that looks E7 covariant. Okay. Now, this kind of action looks horrible if you look at it, if you just write it out in terms of these derivatives of the generalized metric, but it has some nice interpretation as a generalized Ricci scalar that you can construct from generalized connections associated with the generalized lead derivative. And you can play the same game, not just for 11 dimensional supergravity, but for the type two theories, you can go to other dimensions and uh, for all of these, you end up with these exceptional field theories 
based around different kinds of exceptional groups. Okay. So now I want to talk about uh, how this can help us with studying consistent truncations. Remember, in a consistent truncation, we want to have some nonlinear embedding of a lower dimensional theory into 10 or 11 dimensional supergravity. In general, this is very difficult to do. And the consistency relies on a particular group theory argument. So the canonical example that's well understood is where you consider a consistent truncation on a group manifold. Then there's a couple of things that you can use to show that you get a, a consistent truncation. So firstly, you have a global set of, of um, vector fields, like here on S1. Um, in particular, on a d-dimensional group manifold, these will form some frame. And the lead derivative of these global set of vector fields closes into an algebra whose structure constants are exactly the structure constants of the Lie algebra associated to the group manifold. And then this allows you to write down a truncation ansatz that's consistent, where you take some field in your full theory and you factorize out the dependence on the group manifold. And the dependence on the group manifold just appears via this global set of vector fields, these matrices that I called you. Okay. Now, there's other. Um, truncations that are known to be consistent that are not defined on group manifolds, such as the famous uh, uh, consistent truncation of 11 dimensional supergravity on a seven sphere. But it turns out these are instead captured by generalization of group manifolds in exceptional field theory. In particular, these generalized group manifolds are strictly called uh, generalized Leibniz parallelizable manifolds, but they have exactly the same kind of structure that I've just shown you for a group manifold. In particular, they have a global set of now generalized vector fields, which form a frame for the exceptional field theory. So in particular, viewed as a matrix, they're an element of E7. Now their generalized Lie derivative closes and it closes into an algebra and the structure constants here that I call XABC, they completely define the lower dimensional theory, in particular, what gauge groups you get. And then you can write on a truncation ansatz in exactly the same way as before, where all the dependence on the internal space now factorizes and appears just via this E7 frame, this U matrix. Okay. So now I want to show you how can, this can actually be extended to also compute the full Kaluza Klein spectrum around any vacua in the consistent truncation. Now what we will do is we will first compute the Kaluza Klein spectrum um, around the maximally symmetric point of the lower dimensional theory. So in particular, these consistent truncations typically involve some spheres. And when all the scalar fields are turned off, this sphere would be round. So this would be a very simple case to analyze. But then the power of exceptional field theory also allows us to compute the spectrum around any other vacuum when the sphere is deformed in some complicated way. And the reason why this is so easy is because this whole deformation of the sphere is encapsulated via some E7 matrix this E7 matrix MAB. So what do we have to do to um, compute the Kaluza Klein spectrum? Well, firstly, we need to write down an ansatz for our lin linearized fluctuations around some given background. And here we can exploit the fact that we have this global set of generalized vector fields that define our E7 frame. In particular, this gives us a basis for all the fields in our exceptional field theory, and therefore also all the fields in the 10 or 11 dimensional supergravity. As a result of this, when we actually write down the ansatz, we just need to know scalar harmonics on the compactification space to write down arbitrary generalized, arbitrary linearized fluctuations. By contrast, if we did this in the traditional approach, looking at 11 dimensional supergravity directly, we'd have to use different harmonics for the different fields. For example, some symmetric rank two harmonics for the metric and some three form harmonics for the three form, et cetera. So, Already we see some nice simplifications. So then how would we write down the fluctuation ansatz? The generalized metric, for example, this lives in this coset E77 over SU8, as I told you earlier. So a linearized fluctuation will be parameterized by a Lie algebra element in the Lie algebra of E77 minus SU8. So this is how a general linearized fluctuation looks and this JAB sigma for a particular value of sigma is exactly this Lie algebra valued object. Okay. So in particular, the Kaluza Klein ansatz now takes this very simple form. It looks just like the object in the lower dimensional theory, this Lie algebra valued E77 minus SU8 
This space is exactly where the four-dimensional scalar fields would live. And then we just tensor with the space of harmonics, which are labeled here by the label sigma. Moreover, this uh, very simple ansatz allows us to immediately get the mass matrix for all the fields in the exceptional field theory um, because of the interplay with the equations of motion. Now, I won't show you the details, but I just want to emphasize what you need to know. So to compute the kaluza klein spectrum, you just now need two pieces of information. Firstly, you need to know what lower dimensional supergravity you have. This, as I said, is encoded in the structure constants X, A, B, C. And then you also need some higher dimensional information to compute the kaluza klein spectrum. In particular, you need to know how this global set of generalized vector fields, these hues, act on your scalar harmonics. In particular, this action just reduces to the action of the vector part of the generalized vector fields on the scalar harmonics, and it's just given by some constant matrix that I call here curly T. And now these curly T's actually have some very nice interpretation. These are just um, generators of the symmetry group of your lower dimensional supergravity in the representation of the scalar harmonics. Now with these two ingredients, we can write down the mass matrix for any of these compactifications that arise in a consistent truncation. And the mass matrix has three parts. So here I'm looking at the mass matrix for scalar fields. As I said before, the scalar fields, they take the form of the lower dimension supergravity, E77 minus SU8. This is this index I, tensored then with the scalar harmonic sigma. And we have three parts. The first part is just the delta on the harmonics and just has some structure on the lower dimensional supergravity fields. And this is exactly the mass matrix that you would just compute in the lower dimensional supergravity directly. So this is some quadratic expression in the structure constants X. Then there is a part that does nothing on the lower dimensional supergravity index and only does something interesting on the harmonics. This turns out to be exactly the mass matrix corresponding to the spin two fields that we can compute. And it looks like some generalization of a Casimir involving these uh, generators of the symmetry group T. And then finally, there's an interesting object that mixes the lower dimensional information with the higher dimensional information. And this is where all the interesting physics lies. So evaluating this is really the key step to computing the spectrum. And in particular, this uh, curly N is some particular projection of the structure constants of the lower dimensional theory in different ways. Uh, the details are not important. These projectors project onto the coset E77 minus SU8, and it's just some particular combination. Okay, so now I want to show you how we can use this to also compute the kaluza klein spectrum at a less symmetric point. So in particular, we can turn on some scalar fields. These will cause some horrible deformation of our compactification space, which may break all kinds of symmetries but we can still use this method to compute the spectrum. In particular, we can use the same harmonics as for the maximally symmetric point, so like for the round sphere, even though from the traditional approach, you would try and write down harmonics with respect to this much smaller symmetry group. And the key step is that this deformation is just encoded in terms of multiplication by some E77 matrix. So all you have to do is go back to the previous slide, look at the mass matrix, and just insert this E7 matrix in appropriate places. Okay, so now let me show you a couple of applications. Um, in particular, uh, the first application will be about understanding the global structure of the conform manifolds of strongly coupled CFTs. So <clears throat> there is an interesting class of n equals to two ADS4 vacua in type to be supergravity, and in fact, type to be string theory. I won't discuss them in too much detail because I think Adolfo Guarino will talk about them in a lot of detail in his talk. What's important for us is that these are n equals to two ADS4 vacua that arise in some particular four-dimensional supergravity theory. This four-dimensional supergravity theory has some gauge structure, SO6 and SO1,1, semi-direct product R12. Again, the details are not so important. The thing that makes these vacua so interesting is that they actually have two moduli. So they have two exactly flat directions in the four-dimensional potential. And these two moduli um, from the four-dimensional theory, they seem to be non-compact. So they seem to be able to take arbitrarily large positive values. 
Now, for particular values of these moduli, um, we have interesting things which happen. So for generic values, these n equals to two ADS4 vacuum have a very small symmetry group, just U1 times U1. But if we turn off the deformations, we take chi1 and chi2 to zero, we actually get an enlargement of the bosonic symmetry group to SU2 by U1. And then there's a particular value of chi2 where we get an enhancement of supersymmetry. Okay. But now there's a puzzle. Um, <clears throat> here from the four-dimensional perspective, chi1 and chi2, as I said, are non-compact, but the conformal manifold from the CFT perspective is expected to be compact. Um, I won't go into details. There might be other talks about this, but there's some recent arguments in this direction coming from this paper. Right. Now we can study uh, these vacua exactly with the methods that I've told you about. In particular, other people have constructed the consistent truncation to this four-dimensional supergravity and have shown that actually this four-dimensional supergravity arises by a truncation on a five-sphere times a circle. So in particular, all of these different ADS4 vacua are ADS4 vacua of type 2b supergravity. And then also uh, various people uplifted these special points where we have an enhancement of the bosonic symmetry group and the supersymmetry. Now with Alfredo Giambrone, Henning Zampleben, and Mario Trigiante, we want to compute what happens to the kaluza klein spectrum as we move along the conformal manifold. So what happens as we move along the moduli space? And we just focused on one of the directions, the chi one direction. And, and here's what we found. So um, here we have the normalized masses, normalized with respect to the ADS radius. And then along the x-axis, we have um, the chi one par parameter rescaled in terms of uh, t over 2 pi, where t is just the radius of the circle of this S1. And I'm, this is just some particular field, and it's kaluza klein spectrum. And if you look at it for just a couple of seconds, you'll probably see that the kaluza klein spectrum has some very nice symmetry. In particular, it's symmetric around this halfway point here. It's symmetric around the point chi is pi over t. And in fact, it's not just symmetric. Whenever we shift chi 1 by 2 pi over t, we find that the whole kaluza klein spectrum is mapped back onto itself. And what happens is that some of the modes that were heavy when chi 1 is 0 become light when chi 1 gets shifted by 2 pi over t. So this uh, particular mechanism of massive kaluza klein modes becoming massless is known as the space invader scenario. And this is exactly what's happening here. And in particular, we get extra massless modes that do not form part of the consistent truncation whenever chi one is an integer times p over t. And these extra massless modes are very interesting. So for example, we get extra massless vector fields coming whenever, uh, whenever chi one takes these special values. So for example, when chi one is pi over t, we get two extra massless scalar fields and actually the u1 by u1 symmetry enhances again to su2 by u1, just like it did for chi one is zero. And then when chi1 is 2 pi over t, we actually find, again, we get two extra massless vector fields, and again, this enhancement to SU2 by U1. And in fact, the spectrum is identical whenever chi1 is an even integer times pi over t, and the spectrum differs whenever chi1 is an odd integer times pi over t, but still has this enhancement of the gauge symmetry. So what do we find? We find that the fact that chi1 appears to be non-compact is just a four-dimensional artifact. Chi1 isn't actually non-compact when you look at the type 2b string theory. Instead, it has periodicity, and chi1 should really be identified up to 2 pi over t. And in fact, you can see this periodicity also if you look at the uplift. It comes from some nice geometric properties of the compactification space, in particular the complex structure. We also find that there's another distinct vacuum at the halfway point, chi1 is p, pi over t, uh, which is different from the point chi1 is 2 pi over t, but it also has this enhanced symmetry group. Okay. Now we can also compute the full Kaluza Klein spectrum. The details are not important. I just want to show you a formula to prove to you that we can, so we can compute the conformal dimensions as a function of the quantum numbers which appear here, 
for arbitrary values of this chi one. Now, there's an obvious question of what happens with the other modulus of four dimensional supergravity, the chi two direction, uh, which we're still working on. Okay, so now let me discuss in the last five minutes another application to non supersymmetric vacua. These lower dimensional supergravities that we get from consistent truncations typically also include vacua that might break supersymmetry. So we can use this method to compute now the spectrum even for these non supersymmetric vacua. Now, typically, these non supersymmetric vacua suffer from some instabilities. These may come, for example, uh, from the Kaluza Klein spectrum if the mass squared is negative. Or, in fact, for ADS, we would have to have that the mass squared is below the so called Brighton Luna Friedman bound. Now, it turns out when you look at these non supersymmetric vacua within the lower dimensional theories, they often already have instabilities in the lower dimensional theory directly. So for a while, it was hoped that maybe if these vacua are already stable in the lower dimensional theory, then they will also be stable in the full 10 or 11 dimensional supergravity. This is based on this picture that we have for supersymmetric compactifications, where the Kaluza Klein masses increase with the mode number. So if the zero modes are stable, the higher modes should be even more stable. Now we studied uh, a particular example corresponding to ADS4 times a deformation of the seven sphere. This arises in the four dimensional SO8 theory that comes from consistent truncation of M theory on the seven sphere. This is a very complicated deformation. It only preserves SO3 by SO3 symmetry, it breaks all supersymmetries. Computing the Kaluza Klein spectrum traditionally was essentially impossible. But now we were able to compute the Kaluza Klein spectrum for this background, and we found that even though it is stable in the lower dimensional supergravity, higher Kaluza Klein modes do become tachyonic, and so there is an instability in the 11 dimensional supergravity. So let me just briefly show you our results. Um, here, again, I have the Kaluza Klein spectrum, the normalized masses uh, as a function here, essentially of the mode number, and this would be the uh, level zero modes, the modes that are kept in the n equals to eight supergravity, they're both stable. These are just the lowest lying modes. <clears throat> this red line here is the Brighton Luna Friedman bound. So any mode that goes underneath this line triggers an instability. Now we find at level L equals to one, we find that the modes actually decrease of some of the Kaluza Klein fields, but crucially they're still above the Brighton Luna Friedman bound, just. But then at level two, we find the cross. And so this is why we get instabilities. And interestingly, eventually, we find that the Kaluza Klein masses increase with the mode numbers, as would be expected. Okay, so finally, um, there's another set of non supersymmetric examples in four dimensions that, be that can be constructed. Adolfo Guarino um, uh, studied this in great detail. They come from consistent truncation of massive type 2a string theory on a six sphere. And again, there's seven non supersymmetric examples that are stable in the four dimensional theory. And then with uh, Adolfo Guarino and Henning Zampleben, we studied these and we found that these are actually perturbatively stable in the full type 2A string theory. Okay, so with this, let me conclude. I've shown you that we have a new method to compute the Kaluza Klein spectrum of various compactifications, including some with no symmetries or supersymmetries. There's various interesting applications to the ADS-CFT correspondence. We can study stability or instability of non-supersymmetric vacua. In particular, we found hints that there are some stable non-supersymmetric ADS-4 vacua. And let me just end with a slide uh, showing some open questions. Thank you very much for your attention. All right, thank you, Emmanuel, for this nice, interesting talk. Who wants to ask a question? The director likes to ask a question. I'm looking uh, desperately for the Kaluza Klein spectrum of SB3 over two yuans. Uh, using your methods, uh, can you do that? I mean, uh, first, uh, can I find it in the literature? So far, I couldn't find it, but using your methods, uh, starting from the six sphere, you could do it in principle. Maybe we could collaborate on that. <laughs> uh, yeah, so um, 
firstly, I mean, I, I don't know the details of this compactification, but um, if it is really a coset space and the metric really is that on the coset space and so on, then you can use um, other methods directly to compute the full spectrum. Uh, there's a bunch of Italians who worked on this. Uh, I won't try and remember the exact names, but I can give you the reference. Um, whether this can also be tackled by our method um, really depends on whether it is a, a vacuum of a maximal supergravity in lower dimensions. Uh, everything I've said so far really only works currently when we have the consistent truncations to maximal supergravity, while we're also working on extending this to other supergravities with less supersymmetry. Other questions? From the Zoom audience. Let's, we have another look here in the lecture hall. I do not see any other questions. So we thank Emmanuel again. And uh, I believe that we have a break now of uh, half an hour. <laughs>